It's a Friday morning, plus sports and plus TV Africa. Well, on a Friday morning, I will say the weekend is here and rest is near. I don't get any rest, though. I just like the way that phrase sounds. It's not like it's about me. It's about you guys. Rest is near. The weekend is here. Okay? Now, congratulations. The Comoros qualified for the Africa Cup of Nations for the first time. This pipe being held a goalless draw at home by Togo on Thursday in the match day five qualifier. Well, the team from the island states have nine points from five matches in Group G to qualify for 2021 tournament in Cameroon. The Comoros rely heavily on players being born abroad to parents from the South East African nation that has three main islands and a population approaching 900,000 and only three starters against Togo are with top flat clubs in Europe, while one forward, and Ahmed Mogni, plays for French amateur side Comoros are the qu eight qualifiers for the Cup of Nations after defending champions Algeria, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Mali, Senegal, Tunisia, and host Cameroon. I've got Susan Amokwe Louis on the show this morning. Good morning, Susan. Good morning. That was a pleasure to be here. Mm. Susan is a foremost sports presenter and analyst um, on major TV and decisions across them. Let's start with the Comoros, Susan. It's a small island country. For the first time in their history, they qualify for the AFCON in Cameroon. Yes, you know what we say? There are no longer minors in football. Um, it's just that we had uh, other smaller countries are also coming up and trying to do a lot to get their names on the map of uh, the world in terms of football. So it's a good one to know that Cameroon will definitely get to participate in their first ever major tournament. And kudos to the federation, they've been doing a lot in terms of getting everything ready and making sure that there's uh, a lot of players to get them ready for this one. And it's a good one. It's a good one, really. I'm, I'm happy that uh, at least, like uh, if the FIFA president has said, when he was commissioning the new CAF from president, he said that he expected that Africa would definitely produce a winner in the FIFA World Cup. And this is the that they are doing a lot behind the scenes. And this is one of it. So congratulations to Comoros on qualifying. Now, Ghana's Black Stars have, got, have qualified for next year's African Cup of Nations in Cameroon after holding their host South Africa to a one all draw in Johannesburg. Ghana raised their tally to 10 points, same on South Africa, but let the Bifana Bifana on head-to-head -head rule. Sudan are third with nine points, while Sao Tome and Principe are out of the race with no points earned. With Sudan hosting South Africa in the last match day, Ghana are short of one of the top Group C spots, as they also lead Sudan on head-to-head -head rules. Now, um, we're looking at countries that have um, qualified for the AFCON so far, Susan. And now Ghana are on a tight rope. They must win their last match to qualify at this point. Hello, Susan. I think I've lost her there, but we're still on line with her. We have um, Susan Amapoli on the show with us. Um, now, FIFA is set to generate three billion pounds from the World Cup in Qatar while thousands of migrant workers have lost their lives in the Middle Eastern states since it was awarded the Blue Ribbon event. Now, new figures listed in the football governing body's budget for 2022 included in its annual report reveal it's anticipating a windfall from broadcast, marketing rights, and hospitality. But while the international governing body eyes profits, which are expected to exceed 1.1 billion pounds in 2022, the workers who have been preparing for the competition which kicks off on November 21st, more than 6,500 migrant workers from India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka are believed to have died in Qatar since he won the right to host the World Cup 10 years ago. Now, since 2010, seven new stadiums and airports, roads, public transport systems, including a metro, hotels, and a new city, have been built or under construction to host the World Cup finals at a cost. Estimated to be as high as 138 billion pounds. The number of deaths has been compiled from government records in the home countries of the workers, but many are not recorded in details and simply listed as natural. Positive dialogues with a number of um, football associations who um, um, are, you know, are keen to make sure that this World Cup leaves a positive legacy and want, as a member association, to ensure FIFA plays its role. And we, we are encouraging them to, to speak out 
more and more strongly and more loudly on that and also to make sure that they do their homework about going to Qatar and where they stay and where they and how that they use their presence in Qatar as a positive force to ensure that workers uh, workers are, are well treated uh, we will can try and continue to do much more I think you know football associations have uh, a major um, influence in this they've got a major power uh, and a very strong voice uh, and of course the, the, the tournament does pose risks to them if they don't do their homework properly and and, and don't make sure that the the you know the the places they stay and, and, and their activities do don't contribute to uh, contribute to abuses welcome back now basically what that story is about is that there are migrant workers working at the stadiums across on qatar and um, there are migrant workers dying there from nepal from bangladesh from india and the people are complaining the human rights abuse during the the projects being done is alarming these guys don't get paid well, they die, and you send their bodies to their countries and claim the death was natural. How can someone die while working for you in your different stadiums for the World Cup and you call their death natural? How many? Over 200. And they're all tagged natural when they get to the morgue. Well, that's funny though. Now, England, are they back? Different questions to be asked this morning. Are they really, really back? Um, they fill this some fantastic sword. They call themselves the Three Lions. They get to the field, and um, when push comes to show, they miss big teams. They don't make it happen again. Now, Gareth Southgate has challenged the fringe players of the England squad to break into his preferred best 11 and admits there is still competition for places. 50 year old was in high praise of Everton frontman Dominic Calvert Lewin, who he thinks has emerged a consistent high level performer after his brace against San Marino. Calvert Lewin himself believes he doesn't feel the pressure to score, even against the lowest ranked side in the competition, but instead feels confident he will eventually find the back of the net. A debut goal from Oli Watkins was another highlight of the night, with Calvert Lewin describing it as a striker's dream and was very happy for the Aston Villa's talisman. If the game was tomorrow, would I know my best team? And the answer to that would be yes. Um, but Every game we play, every opportunity to play with the clubs, people have the chance to show good form, um, good level of quality, and they of course have the opportunity to change that thinking. So we'd be foolish to, um, to pin ourselves to something now when everything is so fluid and things change so quickly. We've got lots of really good competition for places and... Um, Yes, we think there are a couple of different ways that we can play, and I think that flexibility will be important. Um, but the most pleasing thing is the depth. You know, when we've got youngsters like Jude coming on and playing with the type of confidence he did, and then to see Oli come on and, and get his goal, uh, I think the reaction to his goal in particular told you a lot about this team and this squad. They, they were so pleased for him. I think they make it easier for young players and new players to come in and be themselves and to bed in. And uh, I really like the reaction of the team to his goal. Passes and moves, has intelligence in the positions he takes up, works incredibly hard without the ball to pressure and to, uh, and to win the ball back. Um, so, like, yeah, in the main, the first, my first thing he thought is how lovely to see him back playing um, at the level that we think he can be. Very happy, you know, that's what I set out to do. When I, when I stepped on the pitch and I saw that I was starting, you know, I was very, looking, very much looking forward to it and I knew that I would get chances and it was about staying patient because we had a lot of the ball and, and being in the right place and do, do what I'm good at and that's put the ball in the back of the net. But we had, I don't know what the percentage was, but we had a, a large part of the ball and it's about... I think keeping the standards high it's, in games like that, you can let the standard drop sometimes and because you've got so much of the ball and, and lose a bit of concentration. But I thought to a man, we, we, we kept the tempo up and we kept pressing and still trying to score until, until the end. Well, new boys make it happen. If you know anything about the three lines, the England squad, you understand that um, these are young boys trying to make it happen. Before it was the regular suspects, Jamie Vardy, Harry Kane. And these are young boys, Cavill Lemon, Watkins, scoring his debut goal for England. Young boys fresh from the tilt, and they can make it happen. I guess this means that the three Lions now have alternatives. If you don't have um, Jimmy Vardy, you've got um, 
Calvin Lewin, you've got um, Watkins to make it happen. You don't have um, um, Harry Kane. It's good. It's good for the team, and I think it's good for the squad. Everybody will have to fight for his shirt now, which is good. Now, with waves, smiles, and streamers, the Olympic torch relay kicked off on Thursday, beginning a four-month countdown to the postponed 2020 Summer Games in Tokyo, the first ever organized during a deadly pandemic. Casting a poll over celebrations already sealed back because of coronavirus measures, North Korea launched two short-range ballistic missiles before the relay began in Fukushima, an area hit hard by the 2011 earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster. With organizers billing the games as the Recovery Olympics, a nod to the disaster as well as the pandemic, Thursday's runners included many ever keys who fled their homes after the meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant. About 10,000 runners will take part in a four-month relay, which will go through all Japan's 47 prefectures. Tokyo 2020 Organizing Committee Executive Toshiro Muto said the first day of the relay had gone smoothly, and organizers were able to maintain adequate social distancing among spectators. Welcome back. Now, you ask yourself a question. How do some leaders think? The day the torch is supposed to start the relay, North Korea chose that day to shoot three ballistic missiles into the sea. But basically, most of the runners are not professional athletes. They actually displaced people. Either they were in Fukushima during the power plant disaster. They are actually disaster victims who have been honored. So they are actually not professional athletes. They actually Victims of one disaster or the other who are actually being honored, you know? I think that's good. It makes them feel very important and very relevant. That's nice. Now, seven times Formula One world champion Lewis Hamilton indicated on Thursday he was unlikely to retire at the end of a season that he hoped will be the most exciting yet. 36-year-old Mercedes driver has signed only a one-year contract extension, casting doubt on the intentions for 2022 of the sport's all-time most successful driver, and leading personality. Hamilton's Mercedes team have won the last seven drivers and constructors titles, while the Briton is set to become the first driver to win a 100 Grand Prix with his career tally currently on 95. The 2021 season is the last before major rule changes and Mercedes are expected to face a tough task after a difficult three-day test in Bahrain with a car that appeared tricky to handle. I'm fully committed to, to this sport. I think it's been, um, I think, the sport is in, I think, the best place it's been in terms of the steps we are taking. I'm really proud of what F1 is, is doing in terms of uh, acknowledging that they have a great platform to work towards a, a better world. Um, and I, I, lo I love what I'm doing. I'm really excited. It's been a long wait since last year. Um, obviously, we had the, the test session um, last week uh, so it's, it's like you get a bit of it and now you want uh, yeah you want more obviously so uh, happy that we're here happy that we start tomorrow and then and then we'll go on from there it's obviously been a very long wait in the winter but i'm very happy and excited that the challenge is very close to me and uh, i'm ready to tackle it for now i can't expect what's gonna happen um because i don't have any exper experience so i'm um, 
um, just push hard and uh, uh, for me at the moment it's just try to, I'm aiming to get a point as much as possible. I've done a lot of simulator, uh, the three days we did here we run smoothly. Uh, and yeah, I wish I had more mileage in the car, I wish winter testing would have been a bit longer than what it was, but uh, all things considered I feel like I'm ready to give it a go. I'm happy where we are now, but uh, I think in a couple of races I will feel more comfortable even on the cockpit, uh, the seat, we're still making small modifications, pedal positions, there are things that we need to uh, keep adjusting. Yeah, I feel preparation's been, been key. Uh, obviously it's a new team for me, a new environment, but uh, yeah, I feel, I feel comfortable and feel like we got up to speed pretty well the, you know, a couple of weeks ago, so yeah, ready to get down to it now. It's been a lot of work uh, during these this months uh, with the team getting up to speed on everything, so yeah, just looking forward now to finally start and um, get the, the season on the way and, and uh, yeah, just keep improving race after race and um, yeah, just, I mean, yeah, looking forward massively for Sunday. Um, I think what was the most important thing to feel was that the car was quite predictable, uh, even with the uh, the changes in wind direction and, and temperatures around the test. So, um, yeah, that felt good. Welcome back. Lewis Hamilton says he has no plans, no plans to give up on racing at this point. So whoever is suggesting that should, he's not going to go, go get away that easy, okay? Now, the Super Eagles are getting ready, or they're on their way as we speak, um, to Ben Republic, Porto Novo, for the match, the crunch match against um, Ben Republic tomorrow. Now, they're going by boats. Um, some sad news we heard this morning. The bus that was supposed to meet them in Porto Novo in Cotonou broke down somewhere around the border. We heard it's being worked on right now. So it could just get there before the Super Eagles get there. Well, we don't know what it will do if they get there without a bus get, waiting for them there. But they were with the governor, the Lagos State Governor, Babajidi Sonwulu, yesterday. And he, he, the governor sounded optimistic that, listen, this, they will do well. They will make us proud um, in his time. Things won't go wrong. They'll be successful all the way. Hopefully, amen to that, we say. And of course, Mohammed Musa, the captain, spoke to um, the governor and promised him that, listen, in your time, things won't go wrong. Things will go very successful. And of course, we intend to go there and win and bring you victory. And of course, we expect to see you at a testing Balogun Stadium next week when we take on Lesotho. And the governor promised to be there from the beginning of the match till the end. And um, we're sure he's going to be there for that match too, okay? Um, I guess that's what we can take on the show today, Plus Sports and Plus TV Africa. Um, we promise you I'll bring you Susan Amakweloye on the show sometime maybe tomorrow on Plus Sports Special. Something must be wrong with the network along the line, okay? Join us same time tomorrow, not the same time tomorrow, 11 to 12 tomorrow on Plus Sports Special. We have lots of guests from cricket, the world of football. We'll analyze the match for tomorrow, Nigeria against the Republic. My name is Wally Scott, and I always advise you at the end of every show. If not for anything, at least for your heart, do some sports.